Yep. So this is homework 12 number, which number? Number one, please. Number one. So we have SL2Z. Oh, and we have matrices and we want to compute the order. So um, we say that uh, an element X in a group G has order uh, N if um, X to the N is the identity and N is the smallest positive integer with this property. So if I take one, zero, zero, one, this is the identity. So this has order one. What power of this is the identity? Well, it is the first power. That just means the element. So that has order one. So I take minus one, zero, zero, minus one. I mean, the way you, one, the easiest way, or not necessarily the easiest way, but a method that always works, is you take an element and you start taking its powers, x, x squared, x cubed. And as soon as you get to the identity, you stop. So this is not the identity. So I square it. And when I square it, I get the identity. So this has order two. Let's see, what about zero, one, minus one, zero? So I'll square it. And I get minus one, zero, zero, minus one. And so that's not the identity. Let me cube it. So I take minus one, zero, zero, minus one times the original matrix, zero, one, minus one, zero. And I get zero, minus one, one, zero. Still, so, if this is uh, my x, this is like, this is x squared. This is x cubed. x to the fourth would be this times my original, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And I get 1, 0, 0, 1. So, so this matrix X has order four, because okay. when I start taking the powers, the fourth power is the identity and the first, second and third powers are not. And let's keep going. So suppose X is zero, one, Minus one, one. Let me do this on the other side because it's going to take a lot of writing. So if X is zero, one, minus one, one, X squared is minus one, zero minus one, minus one. So X cubed, which is X squared X, is minus one, zero, minus one, minus one, times zero, one, minus one, one. I get one, minus one, one, Uh, let me just double check because I think I must have made a mistake. Zero, one, minus one, one. So if I square it, zero, one, minus one, one, zero, one, minus one, one, I get minus one, one, and minus one, minus one plus one is zero. Let me just double check. So it's I, 
I understand I the process now. I, it, right, yeah, I just, but I'm curious to find out what the answer is, though. So. Okay, no okay. problem. So x cubed is minus 1, 1, 1, 0, times 0, 1, minus 1, 1. So I get minus 1, minus 1 plus 1 is 0. 0 minus 1. So x cubed is that. Of course, I know this already has orders um, uh, 2. So I know that x to the 6, which, x, which is x cubed uh, squared, is going to be the identity. But that just means the order is 4, 5, or 6. And <coughs> um, So you know six works, but in fact, uh, four or five have to be checked because we're looking for the lowest number? Exactly. Okay, exactly. thank you. Um, let me just look at the last one. The last one is one, so here, x is one, one, zero, one. So we've seen that matrix. If you look at x squared, it's gonna be one, two, zero, one. In general, x to the n will be one, n, zero, one. This is never the identity for all n. So this has no finite order. We say it has infinite order. No finite power of that matrix gives you the identity. Thank you. Can we do homework 11, number 12B? Yep. So homework 11, let me just do all of number 12 quickly. So if we have groups G1 and G2, when you write G1 times G2, this means the collection of all the ordered pairs X1, X2, where X1 is in G1 and X2 is in G2. So you already have seen this in uh, uh, elementary school or somewhere, because as a simple example, if you take R cross R, that's just all the numbers X, Y, X in R, Y in R, that's just the ordinary X, Y plane with vector addition. So this is just an example. So R2, which is R cross R, this you already know. So, I mean, you know exactly what's going on. And we define the multiplication as follows. If you have x1, x2, and y1, y2, I mean, in R2, we use uh, addition as the binary operation. If we use multiplication, you just multiply coordinate wise, x1, y1, x2, y2. If this were addition, you would be adding the coordinates. So this is a binary operation and it's a group. I mean, that's what you have to check in part A. In part A, we want to prove that if G1 is isomorphic to H1 and G2 is isomorphic to H2, then G1 times G2 is isomorphic to H1 times H2. So what has the proof go? Well, if G1 is isomorphic to H1, this means there exists an isomorphism, I'll call it F1, from G1 to H1. So there's a function from G1 to H1 which is a homomorphism and is one to one and onto. And similarly, if G2 is isomorphic to H2, 
This means there exists an isomorphism F2 from G2 to H2. So there's a natural way to define a function F from the product of G1, G2 to the product of H1, H2. And you define it as follows, F of the pair x1, x2 is the pair f of x1, f1 of x1, f2 of x2, right? This makes sense because f1 of x1 is an h1 and f2 of x2 is an h2. So I claim that f is an isomorphism. But of course, that's exactly what has to be checked. So let's check it. So again, we have F from G1 cross G2 to H1 cross H2 defined by F of the pair X1 comma X2 is F of X1 comma f of x2. So <clears throat> suppose we take, so we, what do we have to show? We have to show, first of all, that if I take x1, x2, and I multiply it by y1, y2, and I take um, f of that product, that's the same as f of x1, x2 times f of y1, y2, right? f of the product is the product of the f's. How do we show that? Well, let's just do it, let's see. So what is f of x1, x2 times y1, y2? When I multiply these, I get x1, y1, x2, y2. So I'm really taking f of this product, which is, F1 of X1, Y1, comma, F2 of the product X2, Y2. But these are both homomorphisms. So this is F1 of X1 times F1 of Y1, comma, and F2 of X2, Y2 is F2 of X2 times F2 of Y2. And this is exactly the product, x f of x1, f1 of x1, f2 of x2, multiplied by f1 of y1, f2 of y2. And this is exactly f of x1 comma x2, and this is exactly f of y1 comma y2. So, So that's correct. So this is a homomorphism. And how do we show it's one to one and onto? So let's show it's onto. So suppose we let x, y, oh, sorry, that's not the notation I'm using. Suppose I let um, y1, y2 be any element in g1 cross g2. So since F1 from G1, sorry, in H1 cross H2. So since F1 to H1 is an isomorphism, it's onto, so there exists an X1 in G1, with f of x1 equal to y1. And similarly, there exists an x2 in g2 with f of f1 of x1 equals y1 with f2 of x2 equals y2. So if you put that together, that says f of x1, x2 is f1 of x1, f2 of x2. That's exactly y1, y2. 
So that proves that it's onto. And the proof that this function is also one to one. I'm oh, sorry, is there a question? So the proof that this is one to one is similar. If um, it's enough to show that, suppose that f of x1, x2 is the identity. That means that f1 of x1 is the identity and f2 of x2 is the identity. And that means that x1 equals e1, x2 equals e2. So this is the identity element in the direct product of the groups. So, so there's a certain amount of writing that's required, but that's the proof that if, two, if, if g1 is isomorphic to h1 and g2 is isomorphic to h2, then the direct products are isomorphic. Okay. What else can we do? Um, Professor, homework 12, question eight, please. Homework 12, oh. question eight, thank you. So homework 12, number eight. Yes, thank you. Um, compute the conjugacy classes. So let's just recall something. So we say that uh, in a group um, G, elements X and Y are conjugate if x is g inverse y times g for some g in the group. So that's what it means to be conjugate and what is called the, so this is an equivalence relation and the conjugacy class of x is the set of all y in g that are conjugate to x. Sorry, did you just repeat what you said about it being conjugate, what, it, what that means? So we say two elements are conjugate, X and Y is conjugate in a group, if X is G inverse Y times G for some element of the group. And in one of the recent homework sets, I think there was a, um, uh, well, actually in homework 12, this is defined, right? I mean, this is, in problem five. Uh, yep. I, I was just a little behind on that. So. Yeah, that's right. So in problem four, it defines conjugacy and you prove it's, a conju it's a, an equivalence relation. So there are equivalence classes. The equivalence classes are called conjugacy classes. And the conjugacy class of X, gamma of X is every Y which is conjugate. And now when we're looking at the symmetric group Sn, if we take a cycle, suppose sigma is a cycle, A1, A2, up to A sub K, and we take an element, um, any other permutation, so let tau be an element in Sn. So if you conjugate sigma by tau, so tau, sigma, tau inverse, turns out to be another K cycle. It's the K cycle where tau of A1 goes to tau of A2, goes to tau of A3 and so forth up to tau of A sub K. So if you conjugate a K cycle, you get another K cycle. And conversely, if um, sigma is 
a K cycle and let's say rho is another K cycle. So these are cycles of the same length. Then there exists a permutation tau in Sn such that rho and sigma are conjugate. Tau sigma tau inverse equals rho. So two K cycles are conjugate precisely when they have the same length. So, so let sigma be in Sn any permutation and we prove that every permutation is uniquely a product of cycles. So let me give a different name for this. So that, that alpha be a permutation in, in uh, Sn, there exist cycles, sigma one, let's say up to sigma r, such that alpha is sigma one times sigma two up to sigma r. These are disjoint cycles. And these are unique. Every permutation factors uniquely into a product of pairwise disjoint cycles. And these cycles, if, if um, so let sigma i be a cycle of length k sub i. So this has length k1, this has length k2, and so forth. This has length kr. The sum of these lengths has to equal n. And this partition of the integers completely determines the conjugacy class of alpha. So if you have alpha is some product of cycles, sigma one up to sigma r of lengths k1 up to kr that add up to n, and beta is another permutation uh, where each of these, so here, so sigma i has length ki here, sigma i prime has length l sub i, l sub i. So l1 up to l sub s is equal to n. So alpha and beta are conjugate if and only if you have the same partitions of n, if you have the same number of cycles, r equals s, and if you rearrange if necessary, ki equals li for all i. So for example, what are the conjugacy classes in S3? So you have to look at how many ways you can write S3. Three is a sum of numbers. There only, you have three equals three, three equal two plus one, and three equal one plus one plus one. So there are three conjugacy classes. You can have a three cycle, you can have a transposition, and this just means this is the identity. So there are three conjugacy classes. You either have a three cycle, a two cycle, or the identity. In the conjugacy classes in S4, you have to look at all the ways to write four as a sum of positive numbers. You can have four equals four, four equals three plus one, four equals two plus two, four equals two plus one plus one, or four equals one plus one plus one plus one. So this corresponds to a four cycle. All four cycles are conjugate. This corresponds to a three cycle. All three cycles are conjugate. This corresponds to two transpositions. This corresponds to just one transposition. And this corresponds to the identity. So there are five different conjugacy classes. 
determined by how many different ways you can write the number four as a sum of positive integers. So this actually takes up um, <coughs> five problems in homework 12. Plus it uses information about the symmetric group that was developed in the lectures in previous homework. Thank you. Can we do number two from homework 12? Number two? Yes. Okay. So number two asks us to look at the subgroup of matrices 1, N, 0, 1 in SL2, Z. And we want to know if that is normal. Now, well, let's do an experiment. Um, so let's say I take um, I'm just curious. So I take the matrix zero one minus one zero. Um, in SL2Z, right? This has determinant one, uh, I'll call this Z. And I'll take the matrix, let's just take the simplest matrix that's in H, uh, zero, one, sorry, one, one, zero, one. So if I take Z, X, Z inverse. So if this is Z, what is the inverse of Z? Let's just double check, zero, one, minus one, zero, and zero minus one, one, zero. If I multiply these two together, I get one, zero, zero, one. So this is Z, so this has to be Z inverse. So this is my Z, this is Z inverse. What is Z, X, Z inverse? That's zero, one, minus one, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, minus one, one, zero. So if I multiply these two matrices, I get zero, one, minus one, minus one, times this, zero, minus one, one, zero, and when I multiply that, I get one, zero, minus one, one. Mm -hmm. so, so I guess I made a lucky choice, uh, whatever, let's see. So here's my subgroup H. So H is normal. If Z H Z inverse is contained in H for all Z and S L two Z. And um my fourth word would be curious. So what does it mean for a subgroup to be normal? If you take Z, H, Z inverse, that's always contained in H. So here I take an element 
in H. One, one, zero, one. And here's an element in SL2Z. And its inverse is this. And I conjugate X by Z. So if I did the arithmetic right, I got this matrix. And this matrix doesn't have a zero here. Everything in H has a zero down here. So this is not in H. So, so in this case, X is in H. Z, X, Z inverse is not in H. So H is not a normal subgroup. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, that's the proof. Or the answer to the question is, it's not a normal subgroup. So this is homework 11 number sorry yeah homework sorry which number it was number five it starts with uh but okay yeah. so let f be a homomorphism that's on to so we have f from g to g prime this is a homomorphism that's on to g prime um, so we take a normal subgroup H prime. And so when you have a normal subgroup, you have a quotient group. And so we have the following, this is inclusion. So we have the following sequence of maps. We have F that sends G to G prime. And we have the canonical homomorphism pi from G prime to G prime mod H prime. And the composition of these two is a function I call F. So F is pi composed with F, which goes from G into G prime mod H prime. And this is a homomorphism. Um, Well, it's a homomorphism because composition of homomorphisms is a homomorphism. And I also have say F is onto. And what's the proof of the fact that it's onto? Well, take any coset Take y prime h in g prime mod h prime. So y prime is in g prime. F is onto, which means there exists some x in g with f of x equal to this y prime. So f capital F of x is f is pi composed with f of x f of x is y prime and pi of y prime is y prime times h prime. So every coset here is the image of something in f. So that proves that capital F is not just a homomorphism, but it also is onto. And let me just compute the kernel here. The kernel of f 
it's all x and g such that f of x is the identity. What's the identity here? It's just the coset h prime. So this is all x in g such that what is capital F of x? Capital F of x is F of x h prime is equal to h prime. So this means all x in g such that f of x is in h prime, which is exactly what we mean by the inverse image of h prime. So the kernel of this homomorphism going this way is f inverse of h prime. That's the kernel. And so by the first isomorphism theorem, if you take the canonical map pi from g into this quotient group, there's a unique map from here to here, which is an isomorphism. Um, so this is what we called h. So g mod h is isomorphic to g prime mod h prime. That's the proof of part c. So I have this map from here to here. It's onto the kernel is f inverse of h prime, which I called h. So the, by the first isomorphism theorem, g mod h is isomorphic to g prime mod h prime. So we have to use the first isomorphism theorem. So this is homework 12, number six. Prove that a group, prove that a group consists of one conjugacy class if and only if the group is abelian. Yeah, so So we'll do it. So you have to, this is an if and only if statement. So let's do it in both directions. So suppose, or let's put, let just put it like this. If G is abelian and X and Y are any elements in G, then uh, for all G and G, we have what? We have um, oops, I might have said this backwards and stated this backwards in the problem. If you conjugate X by G, G X G inverse is this because the group is abelian, this is the same as X G G inverse. is the same as X. So, so X is conjugate to Y, if and only if Y equals G X G inverse, which is equal to X. So I actually said the problem in exactly the opposite direction. So, um, so in an abelian group, every element is its own conju conjugacy class. So the set of elements X such that the set of elements Y such that y equals g x g inverse 
is just x. So in fact, yeah, I should have said this exact. I said this exactly wrong. Um, so if the group is abelian, every a conjugacy class consists of just one element, and um, and the converse is also true. So in a group G, if the conjugacy class of an element x is just the set x for all x in G, then G is abelian. Because, for example, if G is not abelian, then there exist X and Y in the group with X, Y different from Y, X. That's what it means for the group not to be abelian. There's some pair of elements that don't compute, which means X, Y, X inverse. Sorry, let me write it differently, which means y x y inverse is not equal to x. So the conjugacy class of x contains at least two elements, x and y x y inverse. So the idea was right, but the statement of the problem was completely wrong. So I will have to change that. Uh, it's not that if the group's a billion, there's only one congruence class. Every element is in the same congruence class. It's exactly the opposite. If a group is a billion, every element is its own congruence class. So you have as many congruence classes as you have elements. Yep. Oh, glad I glad you asked that question. Thank you for answering it. Why? Thank you for explaining it. I hope I did. It would be very hard to prove something that's wrong. Problem five is to show that the conjugacy class of X is, consists only of X, just when X is in the center. And the center of a group is, are the elements that commute with everything. So in an abelian group, every element is in the center. So it follows from problem five that uh, in an abelian group, the conjugacy class of every single element is just that single element. Can we also do, actually, does anyone else have questions first? I feel like I have to laugh. No? I mean, I, I'm all right for now. I've been liking the questions you've been asking. Please go ahead. Okay, can we do uh, in homework 12, number 11, um, okay, so we have a group G and what is called the centralizer and we have an element X in G, what is called the centralizer of X.
c of x it's everything that commutes with x so we can i can write this in two ways i can say it's all g and g such that gx equals xg which is exactly the same as all g and g such that gx g inverse equals x so we want to prove C of X is a subgroup. So suppose we have elements um, G and H in C of X. So what does that mean? That means that G X G inverse and H X H inverse are both equal to X. So what about G times H? If I take G H times X, times gh inverse this is gh x the inverse of gh you reverse the order is h inverse g well hx h inverse is equal to x so this is gx g inverse but gx g inverse is also equal to x so gx gh satisfies this condition so gh is in the centralizer so the centralizer is closed under multiplication. If I take E X E inverse, E is the identity, that's E X E, the inverse of the identity is the identity. This is just X. So the identity is in the centralizer. And let's see what else we can say. So what about inverses? If G is in the centralizer, then g x g inverse is equal to x if i multiply on the left i get x g inverse equals g inverse x i multiply on the left by g inverse if i multiply on the right by g that cancels this i get x g inverse i get x equals x equals g inverse xg and but g is the same as g inverse inverse so this implies that g inverse is in the centralizer so therefore c of x is a subgroup it's a subset of the group that's closed under multiplication contains the identity and contains the inverse of each of its elements. And so C of X, the centralizer, is the whole group if and only if GX, G inverse equals X for all G, which is the same as saying GX equals XG which means every element commutes with X. So X is in what is called the centralizer of G. Okay. Is that okay so far? Yes. All right, should I keep going? This is parts yes. A and B. We have some more. So for part C, we want to prove that GX G inverse equals HX H inverse if and only if the left coset of C of X, G C of X, is the same as the left coset H C of X. So, so what does that mean? So, so we have the left coset G times C of X equals the right coset H times C of X two cosets are equal if and only if 
c of x is g inverse h c of x if and only if g inverse h is in c of x. So what does this say? So if we have, so note, the fact that g x g inverse equals h x h inverse implies if we multiply on the left by uh, g inverse, and if we multiply on the right by g, so this is the same as g inverse h x, and this is the inverse of g inverse h. So, x conjugated by this element is x, so that means that g inverse h is in the centralizer. And that's what we needed to prove. Right? These two cosets are equal, if and only if g inverse h is in the centralizer. Um, so g h g inverse equals this. That implies g inverse h is in the centralizer. This implies that g c of x equals h c of x. So if this is true, then this is true. And if we work backwards, if this is true, then that implies this, that implies this, that implies this, implies this, implies this. Okay, more questions? Does part D just follow directly from that? So part D says there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the left cosets of C of X and the elements of the conjugacy class. So, if um, so, for so every left coset, if you take the left coset g c of x, um, that's equal to h c of x, if and only if um, this condition is satisfied, which means what. Uh, So if you have two different cosets, if g c of x and h c of x are different, then uh, g x g inverse and h x h inverse. Um, let's see, how am I saying this? Should have had if and only if here. Um, So if you take elements in the same conjugacy class, they give the same left the same left cosets. So um, the left cosets. I'm trying to think how I was trying to uh, set this problem up. I have that. Let me think about that because I want to find a nice way to say it and I'm out of time right now. But if you're back at four o'clock, make sure I do this first. Okay, I can, I have a midterm later today, but